1.4 Canned Fresh Frozen Low fat Raw Spicy Takeout 1.5 Fish I Squid Chicken Spicy Grilled Tree E Beef Steamed Beans Breakfast Cat A Grapes Salmon Lamb Cabbage Car R Margarine Carton Jar Warm Clock Ah Sausage Roast Chocolate Box Horse Or Pork Fork Boiled Pour Bull Uh Cook Sugar Pudding Food Boot Oo Spoon Zucchini Fruit Duck 1.6 A I usually have meat or seafood, usually shrimp or something as an appetizer, and then maybe lamb for the main course. B I often have ready-made vegetable soups that you just have to heat up. In fact, they're the only vegetables I ever eat. And I usually have a couple of frozen pizzas in the freezer for emergencies. I don't really order takeout when I'm on my own. But if I'm with friends in the evening, we sometimes order Chinese food for dinner. C. Eggs and soda. I have eggs for breakfast at least twice a week, and I drink a couple of cans of soda every day. D. If I'm feeling down, chicken soup with nice big pieces of chicken in it. It's warm and comforting. Um... I usually have a banana before going to the gym. If I know I'm going to have a really long meeting, I usually have a coffee and a cupcake because I think it will keep me awake and give me energy. E. Fruit. Cherries, strawberries, raspberries, and apples. Vegetables. Peppers, tomatoes, and cucumbers. The only thing I really don't like is zucchini. I can't even stand the smell of it. 1.7 Part 1 What was your favorite food when you were a child? Well, I always liked unusual things. At least things that most English children at the time didn't like. For instance, when I was six or seven, my favorite things were snails oh, and, and prawns with garlic. Funny things for a six-year-old English boy to like. Well... The thing is, my parents like travelling and eating out a lot, and I first tried snails in France. And the prawns, my first prawns, I had at a Spanish restaurant in the town where we lived. So you were interested in Spanish food right from the start. Is that why you decided to come to Spain? Um, partly. But of course, I suppose, like a lot of British people, I wanted to see the sun. The other thing that attracted me when I got here were all the fantastic ingredients. I remember going into the market for the first time and saying, Wow, 
When you opened your restaurant, how did you want it to be different from typical Spanish restaurants? Well, when I came to Spain, all the good restaurants were very formal, very traditional. In London, then, the fashion was for informal places where the waiters wore jeans, but the food was amazing. So I wanted a restaurant a bit like that. I also wanted a restaurant where you could try more international food, but made with some of these fantastic local ingredients. For example, Spain's got wonderful seafood, but usually here it's just grilled or fried. I started doing things in my restaurant, like cooking Valencian mussels in Thai green curry paste. What do you most enjoy cooking? What I most enjoy cooking, I think, are those traditional dishes which use quite cheap ingredients, but they need very long and careful cooking, and then you turn it into something really special, like a really good casserole, for example. And is there anything you don't like cooking? Maybe desserts. You have to be very, very precise when you're making desserts, and that's not the way I am. 1.8. Part 2. What's the best thing about running a restaurant? Um, I think the best thing is making people happy. That's why even after all this time I still enjoy it so much. And the worst thing? Oh, that's easy. It has to be the long hours. This week, for example, I'm cooking nearly every day. We usually close on Sundays and Mondays, but this Monday is a public holiday where lots of people want to eat out, so we're open. Socherea is in all the British restaurant guides now. Does that mean you get a lot of British customers? Uh, yes, we get a lot of British people, especially at the weekends. But then we get people from other countries, too. And are the British customers and the Spanish customers very different? Yes, I think they are. The British always say that everything is lovely even if they've only eaten half of it. The Spanish, on the other hand, are absolutely honest about everything. They tell you what they like, they tell you what they don't like. I remember when I first opened, I had sushi on the menu, which was very unusual at that time. And I went into the dining room and I said to people, so what do you think of the sushi? And the customers, who were all Spanish, said, oh, it was awful. It was raw fish. Actually, I think I prefer that honesty because it helps us to know what people like. What kind of customers do you find difficult? Um, I think customers who want me to cook something in a way that I don't think is very good. Uh, let's see, a, a person who asks for a really well done steak, for instance. For me, that's a difficult customer. You know, they'll say, I want a really, really well done steak. So I give them a really, really well done steak. And then they say, it's tough. And I think, well, of course it's tough. It's well done. Well done steak is always tough. People say that the Mediterranean diet is very healthy. Do you think people's eating habits in Spain are changing? Well, I think they are changing. Unfortunately, I think they're getting worse. People are eating more unhealthily. How do you notice that? Um, I see it with, especially with younger friends. They often eat in fast food restaurants. They don't cook. And actually, the younger ones come from a generation where their mothers don't cook either. That's what's happening now, and it's a real pity. 1.9 1. This week, for example, I'm cooking nearly every day. We usually close on Sundays and Mondays, but this Monday is a public holiday. 2. The British always say that everything is lovely. 3. Actually, I think I prefer that honesty because it helps us to know what people like. 4. Unfortunately, I think they're getting worse. People are eating more unhealthily. 1.13 I agree. In most top restaurants, the chef is a man. For example, Mario Batali or Marcus Samuelson. 
I don't agree. There are many more women chefs than before in restaurants. And at home, women cook much more than men. That's true, but I still think men are better cooks. They're more adventurous in the kitchen. In my opinion, that's only because they don't cook every day. It's easy to be adventurous if you only cook once a week. I'm not sure. I know a lot of men who cook almost every day. I think it depends. 1.14 I agree. I don't agree. I'm not sure. I think it depends. For example, in my opinion, 1.15. Family life is changing in the U.S., but not in the way we might think. The results of several different U.S. surveys expected to find that family relationships were suffering because of the decline in traditional family structures. However, some of the results were very surprising. 32% of young adults under 25 and 10% of adults 30 to 34 still live at home with their parents. 43% of families eat together every day. 33% say they have the TV on during dinner. 50% think a new baby in the family brings more happiness. 49% of adults are happy and enjoy their lives without a lot of stress. 11% of adults are not happy and have a lot of stress or worry in their lives. 60% of teens feel close to their family. 67% of teens want to spend more time with their parents. 75% of parents stay connected with their children on social networks. 40% of parents worry about what their kids post on social networks. 17% of elderly women live with a relative such as a daughter, daughter-in-law, or grandchild. 1.16 1. So, what are you going to do next year, dear? Are you going to go to college? Adam, can you hear me? Sorry, Grandma. What did you say? I said, are you going to go to college next year? No, Grandma. I've already told you a thousand times. I'm not going to go to college yet. I'm going to look for a job. I need to earn some money. All right, dear. You don't need to shout. I can hear perfectly well, thank you. What time is it now? Ten to four. I'll make you a cup of tea. Yes, please, dear. That'd be very nice. Two. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. Hey, what do you mean tomorrow? Aren't you coming back tonight? No, I told you about it yesterday. I'm going to a party at Katie's. I'm staying overnight there. Who else is going? Oh, just the usual crowd. You don't know any of them. Well, make sure you don't go to bed too late. And don't forget to... Bye. Where's your coat? You can't go out like that. It's going to be cold tonight. Bye. Three. Can I use your car tonight? No, you can't. You said you didn't need it. Why can't I borrow it? Because you won't be careful. You'll drive too fast. I won't. I promise. I'll drive really slowly. I'll be really careful. Well, all right. Thanks. See you. One point twenty one. One. Are you coming home for dinner tonight? No. I'm going out with my friends. 2. What are you going to do in the summer? We're going to rent a house with my sister and her husband. 3. Do you think they'll have children soon? I don't think so. Not for a few years, anyway. 1.26 1. Jealous 
anxious, ambitious, generous, rebellious. 2. Sociable, reliable. 3. Responsible, sensible. 4. Competitive, talkative, aggressive, sensitive. 5. Unfriendly, insecure, impatient, immature. 1.27 This morning we're talking about family and family life. And now Danielle Barnes is going to tell us about a book she has just read called Birth Order by Linda Blair. So, what's the book about, Danielle? Well, it's all about how our position in the family influences the kind of person we are. I mean, whether we're first born, a middle child, a youngest child, or an only child, Linda Blair argues that our position in the family is possibly the strongest influence on our character and personality. So, tell us more about this, Danielle. What about the oldest children in a family, the firstborn? Well, firstborn children often have to take care of their younger brothers and sisters, so they're usually sensible and responsible as adults. They also tend to be ambitious, and they make good leaders. Many U.S. presidents and British prime ministers, including, for example, Abraham Lincoln, were oldest children. On the negative side, oldest children can be insecure and anxious. This is because when the second child was born, he or she lost some of his or her parents' attention, and maybe he or she felt rejected. That's very interesting. What about the middle child? Middle children are usually more relaxed than oldest children. That's probably because the parents are more relaxed themselves by the time the second child arrives. They're usually very sociable, the kind of people who get along with everybody. And they're also usually sensitive to what other people need. Now, this is because they grew up between older and younger brothers and sisters. For the same reason, they're often good at sorting out arguments, and they're always sympathetic to the ones on the losing side, or, in general, to people who are having problems. On the other hand, middle children can sometimes be unambitious, and they can lack direction in life. And youngest children? I was very interested in this part of the book because I'm a youngest child myself. It seems that youngest children are often very outgoing and charming. This is the way they try to get the attention of both their parents and their older brothers and sisters. They are often more rebellious, and this is probably because it's easier for the youngest children to break the rules. By this time, their parents are more relaxed about discipline. On the negative side, youngest children can be immature and disorganized, and they often depend too much on other people. This is because they have always been the baby of the family. Fascinating. And finally, what about only children? Only children usually do very well at school because they have a lot of contact with adults. They get a lot of love and attention from their parents, so they're typically self-confident. They're also independent because they're used to being by themselves. And because they spend a lot of time with adults, they're usually very organized. I'm an only child myself, and people always think that I must be spoiled. Is that true, according to Linda Blair? Well, it's true that only children can sometimes be spoiled by their parents because they're given everything they ask for. Also, on the negative side, only children can be selfish. And they can also be impatient, especially when things go wrong. This is because they're not used to sorting out problems with other brothers and sisters. 1.28 My name's Jenny Zielinski, and New York is my city. I live here, and I work for a magazine, New York 24-7. My name's Rob Walker. I'm a writer on New York 24-7. You can probably tell from my accent that I'm not actually from New York. I'm British and I came over to the States a few months ago. 
I met Rob in London when I was visiting the UK on a work trip. He was writing for the London edition of 24-7. We got along well right away. I really liked him. So why am I in New York? Because of Jenny, of course. When they gave me the opportunity to work here for a month, I took it immediately. It gave us the chance to get to know each other better. When they offered me a permanent job, I couldn't believe it. I helped Rob find an apartment, and now here we are, together in New York. I'm so happy. I just hope Rob's happy here too. I really loved living in London. A lot of my friends and family are there, so of course I still miss it. But New York's a fantastic city. I've got a great job, and Jenny's here too. Things are changing pretty fast in the office. We have a new boss, Don Taylor. And things are changing in my personal life too. This evening's kind of important. I'm taking Rob to meet my parents for the very first time. I just hope it goes well. One point twenty nine. I can't believe we got here so late. I'm sorry, Jenny. I had to finish that article for Dawn. Don't forget the chocolates. Okay. Oh no! Oh, I don't believe it. Don't tell me you forgot them. I think they're still on my desk. You're kidding. You know what my desk's like. Yeah, it's a complete mess.、Oh. Why don't you ever tidy it? We could go and buy some more. How can we get some more? We're already late.、Uh, hi there. You made it. Sorry, we're late.、Uh, so this is my mom and dad, Harry and Sally, <laughs> and this, of course, is Rob. Hello. It's so nice to meet you at last. Yes, Jenny's finally decided to introduce you to us. <laughs> come in, come in. <laughs> Mom, I'm really sorry.、Uh, we bought you some chocolates, but we left them at the office.、Oh, what a pity. Never mind. Yeah, don't worry about it. We know what a busy young woman you are. And your mom has made way too much food for this evening, anyway. <laughs> oh, Harry! <laughs> But I also have some good news. Really? What's that? Well, you know we have a new boss.、Mm -hmm. He's still new to the job and needs support. So today he made me the managing editor of the magazine. Oh, <gasps> so you've got a promotion!、Uh, how fantastic! That's great news. Hey, does that mean Jenny's going to be your boss, Rob? Uh, yes, I guess so. <laughs>、uh, well, not exactly. I'm a manager, but I'm not Rob's manager. Let's. Go and have dinner. What a great idea! One point thirty. One. Don't forget the chocolates. Okay. Oh no! Oh, I don't believe it. Don't tell me you forgot them. I think they're still on my desk. You're kidding. Two. Mom, I'm really sorry.、Uh, we bought you some chocolates, but we left them at the office.、Oh, what a pity! Never mind. Three. But I also have some good news. Really? What's that? Four. So you've got a promotion.、Uh, how fantastic! That's great news. Five. Let's go and have dinner. What a great idea. One point thirty-one. You're kidding. 
I don't believe it. Really? How fantastic! That's great news! What a great idea! Oh no! What a pity! Never mind. One point thirty two. You know, our Jenny has done incredibly well, Rob. She's the first member of our family to study at Harvard. She's a very capable and ambitious young woman. Oh, Dad. No, it's true, Jenny. But what about you, Rob? How do you see your career? Do you see yourself going into management? Me? No, not really. I'm more of a, a writer. Really? What kind of things do you write? Um, you know, interviews, reviews, things like that. And I'm doing a lot of work for the online magazine. Uh, Rob's a very talented writer, Dad. He's very creative. That's great, but being creative doesn't always pay the bills. You know, my dad's a very keen photographer. He took all of these photos. No, Rob won't be interested in those. But I am interested. I mean, I like photography, and I think I recognize some of these people. That's because most of them are of Jenny. But. There are some great jazz musicians too.、Um, that's Miles Davis, and isn't that John Coltrane? And that's Wynton Marsalis. You know about Wynton Marsalis? Know about him? I've interviewed him. <sighs> How incredible! I love that guy. He's a hero of mine. Well, he's a really nice guy. I spent a whole day with him, chatting and watching him rehearse. Really? I want to hear all about it. Have a cookie, Rob. <laughs> Go ahead, son. Sally makes the best cookies in New York. One point thirty-three. How do you see your career? Not really. I'm more of a writer. Uh, you know. Interviews, reviews, things like that. I mean, I like photography. That's because most of them are of Jenny. How incredible! Well, he's a really nice guy. Go ahead, son. One point thirty-eight. Up. Ah.、Uh. Done. Money. Nothing. Some. One. Clock. Ah. Dollar. Honest. Shopping. Phone. Oh. Clothes. Loan. Go. Oh. Sold. One point thirty-nine. Afford. Order. Worth. Organized. Mortgage. Store. Work. One point forty. One. I'm a spender. I think. I try to save, but something always seems to come along that I need to buy, and I end up broke. I can get by with very little money for myself when I need to, but I don't seem to be good at holding on to it. 
Also, if my kids ask to borrow some money, I always say yes. 2. I would say that I'm a spender. I spend money on things like concerts or on trips because I like having the experience and the memories. I know that I should spend my money on things that last or save for the future, but I don't want to miss all those good things that are happening right now. 3. I consider myself a spender. I don't have much money, but when I do have some, there's always something I need or want to spend it on. I love computers and computer games, so I buy things to make sure my computer is always up to date. I know it's not very sensible, but it's important to me. 4. That's hard to say. I can save money if there's something I really, really want, but usually my money disappears as soon as I get it. I get some money from my parents every week, so I have just enough money to go to the movies with my friends and to buy something for myself, maybe a book or a DVD or some makeup. I usually end up buying something, but, for example, If I want to go on a trip with my friends, then I can make an effort and save some money for a few weeks. 5. Since I was little, I've always saved about a third of the money I get. I would never think of spending all the money I have. You could say that I'm careful about money. When I want to buy something that's expensive, I don't use a credit card. I take the money out of the bank, so I never have to worry about getting into debt. Six. I'd say a saver, definitely. I like having some money saved in case I have an emergency. I also think very carefully before I buy something, and I always make sure it's the best I can buy for that price. But I wouldn't describe myself as cheap. I love buying presents for people, and when I do spend my money, I like to buy nice things, even if they're more expensive. 1.41. I haven't seen those shoes before. Are they new? Yes, I just bought them. Do you like them? They're okay. How much did they cost? Oh, not much. They were a bargain, under $100. You mean $99.99. That isn't cheap for a pair of shoes. Anyway, we can't afford to buy new clothes right now. Why not? Have you seen this? No. What is it? The phone bill. It came this morning. And we haven't paid the electricity bill yet. Well, what about the iPad you bought last week? What about it? You didn't need a new one. The old one worked just fine. But I needed the new model. Well, I needed some new shoes. 1.45 Part 1 Jane, you're an elementary school teacher and a writer. What kind of books do you write? Well, I write books for children who are learning English as a foreign language. How long have you been a writer? Hmm, let me see, since 1990. So, for about 22 years. Tell us about the trip that changed your life. Where were you going? Well, it was in the summer of 2008, and my family, My husband and I and our three children decided to have a holiday of a lifetime and to go to Africa. We went to Uganda and Rwanda to see the mountain gorillas. It was something we'd always wanted to do. Anyway, about halfway through the trip, we were in Uganda and we were travelling in a lorry when the lorry broke down. So the driver had to find a mechanic to come and help fix it. And then what happened? Well, as soon as we stopped, lots of children appeared and surrounded us. I could see some long buildings quite near, so I asked the children what they were, and they said in English, that's our school. And I was very curious to see what a Ugandan school was like, so I asked them to show it to me. What was it like? I was shocked when I first saw it. The walls were falling down. The blackboards were broken and there weren't many desks. But the children were so friendly and I asked them if they would like to learn a song in English. They said yes 
And I started teaching them some songs, like Head, Shoulders, Knees and Toes, a song I've used all over the world to teach children parts of the body. Almost immediately, the classroom filled up with children of all ages, and they all wanted to learn. I was just amazed by how quickly they learned the song. Did you meet the teachers? Yes, we did, and the headmaster too. He explained that the school was called St Joseph's. And it was a community school for orphans, very poor children and refugees. I asked him what the school needed. I thought that he might say, we need books or paper, and then later we could send them to him. But actually, he said, what we need is a new school. And I thought, yes, of course, he's right. These children deserve to have better conditions than this to learn in. So when I got back home... My husband and I, and other people who were with us on the trip, decided to set up an organisation to get money to build a new school. 1.46 Part 2 So Adelante, Africa was born. Why did you decide to call it that? Well, we wanted a name that gave the idea of Africa moving forward. And my husband is Spanish, and he suggested Adelante Africa, because in Spanish, Adelante means go forward. And Adelante Africa sort of sounded better than go forward Africa. How long did it take to raise the money for the new school? Amazingly enough, not long really, only about two years. The school opened on the 14th of March 2010 with 75 children. Today, it has nearly 500 children. That's great. I understand that since the new school opened, you've been working on other projects for these children. Yes. When we opened the school, we realized that although the children now had a beautiful new school, they couldn't really make much progress because they were suffering from malnutrition, malaria, things like that. So we've been working to improve their diet and health. And at the moment, we're building a house where children who don't have families can live. And are your children involved in Adelante, Africa, too? Yes, absolutely. They all go out to Uganda at least once a year. My daughter Tessie runs the Facebook page, and my other daughter Anna runs a project to help children to go to secondary school. And Georgie, my son, organizes a football tournament there every year. And how do you think you have most changed the children's lives? I think the school has changed the children's lives because it has given them hope. People from outside came and listened to them and cared about them. But it's not only the children whose lives have changed. Adelante Africa has also changed me and my family. We've been very lucky in life. I feel that life has given me a lot. Now I want to give something back, but it's not all giving. I feel that I get more from them than I give. I love being there. I love their smiles and how they have such a strong sense of community. And I love feeling that my family and the other members of Adelante Africa are accepted as part of that community. And do you have a website? Yes, we do. It's www. AdelanteAfrica.com We've had the website for about four years. It was one of the first things we set up. If you'd like to find out more about Adelante Africa, please go there and have a look. There are lots of photos and even a video my son took of me teaching the children to sing on that very first day. Maybe it will change your life too. Who knows? One point forty nine. One. How long have you been learning French? Two. I've been learning French for three years. Three. How long has it been raining? Four. It's been raining since lunchtime. Five. How long have you been waiting? Six. 
I've been waiting for half an hour. 1.50 One. It's snowing. How long has it been snowing? Two. I'm learning Korean. How long have you been learning Korean? Three. Natalia has been working in Brazil. How long has Natalia been working in Brazil? Four. John is looking for a job. How long has John been looking for a job? Five. They're living with Mary's parents. How long have they been living with Mary's parents? Six. I'm going to salsa classes. How long have you been going to salsa classes? Seven. It's raining. How long has it been raining? Eight. Justin is going out with Brittany. How long has Justin been going out with Brittany? 1.51 Phone call 1 Everything went wrong. I only managed half a day on Wednesday, the first day, and on Thursday we started late, so I'm already behind. I've been suffering from the heat. It's absolutely boiling, and the humidity is 100% at lunchtime. I went the wrong way, and I had to paddle against the current. I was exhausted. They asked me, do you want to give up? But I said no, because I've also been having a wonderful time. There are pink dolphins, pink, not grey, that come close to the boat. I think that if I can do 62 miles a day, then I can make it. Phone call two. I've been on the Amazon for a week now, and I've been paddling for six out of the seven days. The river is incredibly wide, and it's very hard to paddle in a straight line. The water is so brown that I can't see my paddle once it goes under the surface. It looks like melted chocolate. I start at 5.30 in the morning, and I paddle for at least 10 hours from 5.30 a.m. until dark, with only a short break for lunch. My hands have been giving me problems. I have big blisters. I now have them bandaged in white tape. I'm usually on the water for at least ten hours. It's boring at times and exciting at others. I listen to music on my iPod. I've been listening to Don't Stop Me Now by Queen to inspire me. Phone call three. I haven't been feeling very well this week. The problem is heat exhaustion. They say it's because I haven't been drinking enough water. I've been travelling 62 miles a day, which is my target. But yesterday, after 52 miles, I was feeling sick and my head was aching and I had to stop and rest. 1.52 Phone call 4 I haven't had any music for the last three days because my iPod broke, so paddling has been getting more boring. To pass the time, I count or I name countries in my head, and sometimes I just look up at the sky. Sometimes the sky is pink with clouds that look like cotton, and other times it's dark like the smoke from a fire, and sometimes it's bright blue. The day that I reached the halfway point in my trip, the sky was bright blue. I'm superstitious, so I didn't celebrate. There's still a very long way to go. Phone call five. This week, the mosquitoes have been driving me crazy.
They obviously think I'm easy food. They especially like my feet. I wake up in the night when they bite me, and I can't stop scratching my feet. But I'm feeling happier now than I've been feeling for weeks. I've seen a lot of amazing wildlife this week. One day, I found myself in the middle of a group of dolphins. There were about six pairs jumping out of the water. I've also seen enormous butterflies, iguanas and vultures that fly above me in big groups. Yesterday, a fish jumped into my kayak. Maybe it means I'm going to be lucky. I'm starting to feel a little sad that this adventure is coming to an end. And finally in the news, TV host Helen Skelton has successfully completed her 1,998-mile trip down the Amazon River in a kayak. She left from Nauta in Peru six weeks ago on a trip that many people said would be impossible. But yesterday, she crossed the finish line at Almarin in Brazil to become the first woman to paddle down the Amazon. Here's Helen. It's been hard but I've had an amazing time. The only thing I've really missed is my dog Barney. So the first thing I'm going to do will be to pick him up and take him for a nice long walk. 1.53 1. Was Lisa's father angry about the car? Yes, he was furious. 2. Is Oliver's apartment small? Yes, it's really tiny. Just a bedroom and a living room. 3. Are you afraid of flying? Yes, I'm terrified. I never fly anywhere. 4. Was the food good? Yes, it was delicious. 5. Are you very hungry? I'm starving. I haven't eaten all day. 6. Is your parents' house big? It's enormous. It has seven bedrooms. 7. Was it cold in Moscow? It was freezing, minus 20 degrees. 8. Was Jack's kitchen dirty? It was filthy. It took us three hours to clean it. 9. Are your parents happy about the wedding? They're excited. In fact, they want to pay for everything. 10. Was the movie funny? It was hilarious. We laughed all the way through. 11. Are you sure you locked the door? I'm positive. I remember turning the key. 12. Were you surprised to hear that Ted is getting married? I was absolutely amazed. I never thought it would happen. 1.54 Max, what do you like eating when you're feeling a little down? Brownies. I love brownies. Chocolate brownies. My sister would always make these brownies, and she would let me eat them. And they sent some to me a little while ago, and they were just fantastic. Does it make you feel better? Oh, absolutely. They're great. Sometimes I give them to other people who aren't feeling so good and they feel better too. Andrew. How often do you eat out? Lately I've been eating out a lot, um, but I try not to eat out to save money. What kind of places do you go to? I like any kind of Asian food, and steak is good, but it's kind of expensive. Why do you like these kinds of restaurants? I like them because they're, they're different. I like to cook and they're, the food is different from the things that I know how to make. Samantha. Do you have brothers and sisters? I do. I have one younger brother and he's 16 years old. How well do you get along with him? Ooh, <laughs> sometimes I get along better with him uh, depending on how much time we spend together. <laughs> Zenobia. Are you a spender or a saver? I'm a very big spender. <laughs> Can you give examples? Uh, bags. 
I um, have a weakness for bags. I love designer bags. And uh, when I see something in the shop which is on sale and it's half price and reduced, all my savings for the last three months will go on that item. So bags is a weakness. Bags, bags, bags. <laughs> Skylar. Have you ever taken part in a charity event? I have. I have been a captain at the Relay for Life event in my home state in Kentucky, in America, and we raise money for cancer patients. How much money did you raise? I have raised $15,000 in total. 2.4 Shower Shh Jazz J. Chess. Ch. 2.5. Shower. Sh. Crash. Rush. Station. Jazz. J. Bridge. Dangerous. Traffic jam. Chess. Ch. Adventure, catch, each. 2.6 1. A. Cheap. B. Jeep. 2. A. Chain. B. Jane. 3. A. Choke. B. Joke. 4. A. Ship. B. Chip. 5. A. Shoes. B. Choose. 6. A. Wash. B. Watch. 2.7 1 Jeep 2 Chain 3 Joke 4 Chip 5 Shoes 6 Watch 2.8 1. Do you like potato chips? 2. I'm going to wash it. 3. You choose. 4. Don't joke about it. 5. Is it cheap? 2.9 Tanner took a taxi from the boatyard to the airport where the seaplane was leaving from. It took 45 minutes to get from the boatyard to the airport. Once he got on the seaplane, Tanner quickly made up the time he spent riding in the taxi. With the plane flying close to 100 miles an hour, Tanner caught up to Rutledge and Adam near Seven Mile Bridge. After landing at the airport in Key West, Tanner rented a scooter for the last three miles of the race. Just a few more minutes until he arrived at the southernmost point of the U.S. Two point ten. Rutledge Wood, who had traveled in the boat, ran from the Key West boatyard to the streets of Key West. After running for a few minutes in the heat, he hailed a taxi, which brought him to the southernmost marker in Key West and the U.S. Unfortunately, Adam and Tanner were already standing next to the marker. Rutledge couldn't believe it. He looked at the other men who were standing nearby laughing. It turns out that Adam, traveling in the Lotus Evora, had reached the Key West marker just seconds before Tanner arrived on his rented scooter. Adam's car had won, which is a good thing, because Top Gear is, after all, a program about cars.
Tanner's combination of taxi, seaplane, and scooter arrived second, several minutes before Rutledge, who ended his boat trip with a ride in a taxi. 2.14 1. Riding a motorcycle is more exciting than driving. 2. The fastest train only takes an hour and a half. 3. It's more difficult to drive at night than during the day. 4. My father's worse at driving than my mother. 5. The most dangerous road in my town is the freeway. 2.15 And on tonight's program, we talked to Tom Dixon, who is an expert on road safety. Tom, new technology like GPS devices has meant new distractions for drivers, hasn't it? That's right, Nikki. But it isn't just technology that's the problem. Car drivers do a lot of other things while they're driving that are dangerous and that can cause accidents. Remember, driver distraction is the number one cause of road accidents. Now, I know you've been doing a lot of tests with simulators. According to your tests, what's the most dangerous thing to do when you're driving? The tests we did in a simulator showed that the most dangerous thing to do while you're driving is to send or receive a text message. This is incredibly dangerous, and it is, of course, illegal. In fact, research done by the police shows that this is more dangerous than drinking and driving. Why is that? Well, the reason is obvious. Many people use two hands to text, one to hold the phone and the other to type, which means that they don't have their hands on the wheel and they're looking at the phone, not at the road. Even for people who can text with one hand, it's still extremely dangerous. In the tests we did in the simulator, two of the drivers crashed while texting. And which is the next most dangerous? The next most dangerous thing is to set or adjust your GPS. This is extremely hazardous, too, because although you can do it with one hand, you still have to take your eyes off the road for a few seconds. And number three? Number three was putting on makeup or doing your hair. In fact, this is something that people often do, especially women, of course, when they stop at traffic lights. But if they haven't finished when the lights change, they often continue when they start driving again. It's that fatal combination of just having one hand on the steering wheel and looking in the mirror, not at the road. And number four... In fourth place, there are two activities that are equally dangerous. One of them is making a phone call on a cell phone. Our research showed that when people talk on the phone, they drive more slowly, which can be just as dangerous as driving fast. But their control of the car gets worse because they're concentrating on the phone call and not on what's happening on the road. But the other thing, which is just as dangerous as talking on your cell phone, is eating and drinking. In fact, if you do this, you double your chance of having an accident because eating and drinking always involves taking at least one hand off the steering wheel. And the thing that's most worrying here is that people don't think of this as a dangerous activity at all. And it isn't even illegal. And in fifth, well, actually sixth place, it must be listening to music, but what kind? Well, it's listening to music you know. Oh, that's interesting. We found in our tests that when drivers were listening to music they knew and liked, they drove either faster or slower, depending on whether the music was fast or slow. So fast music made drivers drive faster. Exactly. And a study in Canada also found that if the music was very loud, then drivers' reaction time was 20% slower. 
If you are listening to very loud music, you're twice as likely to go through a red light. So the safest of all the things on the list is to listen to music we don't know. Exactly. If we don't know the music, then it doesn't distract us. In this part of the tests, all drivers drove safely. Two point seventeen. One. I saw an old man with a dog. Two. It's a nice house. She's a lawyer. Three. What an awful day. Four. I have classes three times a week. Two point twenty. Computer. A. Uh, A. Uh, about. Anniversary. Complain. Credible. Problem. Talkative. Usually. Woman. Two point twenty one. One. What are we going to have for lunch today? Two. I'd like to see a good movie tonight. Three. Please stop complaining about the weather. Four. The woman in the kitchen is very talkative. Five. There's a problem with the computer. Two point twenty two. The movies. The end. The other day. The world. The sun. The internet. The kitchen. The answer. The earth. Two point twenty three. Excuse me. Is this seat empty? Yes, sure. Sit down. Ah, he's cute. Is he yours? Yes, yes. Actually, he's a she, Miranda. Oh, three months. Three and a half. How about yours, Stephen? He's four months. <sighs> Did you have a bad night? Yes, Miranda was crying all night. You know that noise gets to you. It drives me crazy. Do you know what you need? These. What are they? Earplugs. Yes, earplugs. When the baby starts crying, you just put these in. You can still hear the crying, but the noise isn't so bad, and it's not so stressful. That's a great idea. Who told you to do that? It's all in this book I read. You should get it. Yeah. What's it called? It's called Commando Dad. It was written by an ex-soldier. He was a commando in the army, and it's especially for men with babies or small children. It's pretty good. Really? So what's so good about it? Well, it's like a military manual. It tells you exactly what to do with a baby in any situation. It makes everything easier. There's a website too that you can go to, commandodad.com. It has a lot of advice about taking care of babies and small kids. And I really like the forums where men can write in with their problems or their experiences. What kind of things does it help you with? All kinds of things. How to change diapers. He has a really good system. How to dress the baby. How to get the baby to sleep. The best way to feed the baby. How to know if the baby is sick. It's really useful, and it's pretty funny too. I mean, he uses a kind of military language. So, for example. He calls the baby a BT, which means a baby trooper, and the baby's bedroom is base camp, and taking the baby for a walk is maneuvers, and taking the diapers to the trash is called bomb disposal. What else does it say? Well, it has all kinds of stuff about. And what does he think about men taking care of children? Does he think we do it well? He thinks that men are just as good as women at taking care of children in almost everything. Almost everything? Yeah, he says the one time when women are better than men is when the kids are sick. 
Women kind of understand better what to do. They have an instinct. Oh, now it's my turn. Okay, I know exactly what that cry means. It means he's hungry. Wow, what was that book called? 2.24 Generally speaking, I think women worry more about their appearance than men. They tend to spend hours choosing what to wear, doing their hair, and putting on makeup. Women are also usually better at making themselves look more attractive. But I think that in general, men are more worried than women about their body image. They feel more insecure about their hair, for instance, especially when they're going bald. 2.27 1. When you're with friends of the same sex, what do you usually talk about? 2. Are there any sports or games that you're good at? 3. Is there anything you're really looking forward to? 4. Who in your family are you closest to? 5. What kind of movies are you interested in? 6. Are there any animals or insects that you're afraid of? 7. What's your town famous for? 8. Are there any superstitions that you believe in? 2.28 You work hard, but your money's all spent Haven't got enough to pay the rent You know it's not right, and it makes no sense To go chasing, chasing those dollars and cents Chasing Chasing those dollars and cents. That was great, Kerry. Thanks. Kerry, you used to be in a band. Now you play solo. Why did you change? What happened with the band is private. I've already said I don't want to talk about it in interviews. All I'll say is that I have a lot more freedom this way. I can play and say what I want. Did your relationship with the band's lead guitarist affect the breakup? No comment. I never talk about my private life. Hmm. Your dad was in a famous punk band and your mum's a classical pianist. Have they influenced your music? Of course they have. What do you think? Isn't everyone influenced by their parents? When did you start playing? I started playing the guitar when I was about four. Four? That's pretty young. <laughs> yeah. The guitar was nearly as big as me. <laughs> I think that your new album is your best yet. It's a lot quieter and more experimental than your earlier albums. Thank you. I think it's my best work. So, what have you been doing recently? Well, I've been writing and recording some new songs, and I've played at some of the summer festivals in the UK. And what are you doing while you're in the States? I'm going to play at some clubs here in New York. Then I'm doing some small gigs in other places. I just want to get to know the country and the people. It's all very new to me. Dollars and cents Chasing Chasing those dollars and cents Good job, Rob. She isn't the easiest person to interview. She's OK. And this video clip will work great online. Well, thank you for coming in today, Carrie. <laughs> now I suggest we have some lunch. Rob, could you call a taxi? Uh, sure. Two point twenty nine. So, uh, when will you be coming back to New York, Carrie? Oh, I don't know. Hi, guys. Is everything okay? Uh, yes, it's delicious. Thank you. That's great. New York waiters never leave you alone. <laughs> I really don't like all this, hi guys, is everything okay stuff. What? 
You mean waiters aren't friendly in London? Oh, they're very friendly. Yes, they're friendly, but not too friendly. They don't bother you all the time. Can I get you anything else? More drinks, maybe? No, thanks. We're fine. Fantastic. See what I mean? Personally, I think people in London are a lot more easygoing. London's just not as hectic as New York. Sure, we all like peace and quiet. But in my opinion, New York is possibly, well, no, is definitely the greatest city in the world. Don't you agree? <laughs> to be honest, I definitely prefer London. Come on, Rob. You've lived in both. What do you think? Um. Well, I have to say, London's very special. It's more relaxed. It's got great parks, and you can cycle everywhere. It's dangerous to cycle in New York. <laughs> Why would you cycle when you can drive a car? <laughs> you can't be serious. Okay, I agree. London has its own peculiar charm, but if you ask me, nothing compares with a city like New York. The whole world is here. But that's the problem. It's too big. There are too many people. Everybody's so stressed out, and nobody has any time for you. I don't think that's right, Carrie. New Yorkers are very friendly. Oh, sure, they can sound friendly with all that "have a nice day" stuff, but I always think it's a little bit fake. You've got to be kidding me! Oh, I'm sorry. I'll just have to take this. Hello. Yes. You're who? The taxi driver. What did she leave? Her cell phone. Right. Oh, okay. Yes, we're still at the restaurant. See you in about five minutes. Two point thirty. One. Personally. I think people in London are a lot more easygoing. London's just not as hectic as New York. Sure, we all like peace and quiet, but in my opinion, New York is possibly—well, no—is definitely the greatest city in the world. Don't you agree? <laughs> to be honest, I definitely prefer London. Come on, Rob. You've lived in both. What do you think? Two. Okay. I agree. London has its own peculiar charm, but if you ask me, nothing compares with a city like New York. The whole world is here. But that's the problem. It's too big. There are too many people. Everybody's so stressed out, and nobody has any time for you. I don't think that's right, Carrie. New Yorkers are very friendly. Oh, sure, they can sound friendly with all that "have a nice day" stuff. Two point thirty-one. Personally, I think. But in my opinion, don't you agree? To be honest, what do you think? Okay, I agree. But if you ask me. I don't think that's right. Oh, sure. Two point thirty-two. Thank you for a nice lunch, Don. You're welcome. Thanks for coming, guys. Have a nice day. See, nice, friendly service. Maybe. But I think she saw the big tip you left on the table. <laughs> Did you mean what you said in the restaurant, Rob? Did I mean what? About missing London. Sure, I miss it, Jenny. Really? But hey, not that much. It's just that moving to a new place is always difficult. But you don't regret coming here, do you? No, no, not at all. It's just that. You seemed homesick in there, for the parks, the cycling. Well, there are some things I miss, but oh, hang on a minute! Look over there. 
Our taxis come back. Excuse me, ma'am. Who, me? What is it? I believe this is your cell phone. You left it in my cab. What? Oh, wow. Thank you. Have a nice day. That was so kind of him. See? New Yorkers are really friendly people. <laughs> Two point thirty three. Did you mean what you said in the restaurant, Rob? It's just that you seemed homesick in there. Oh, hang on a minute. Our taxis come back. That was so kind of him. Two point thirty six. One. I'd love to be able to ski. Two. We won't be able to come. Three. I've never been able to dance. Four. She hates not being able to drive. Two point thirty seven. One. I'd love to be able to ski, ride a horse. I'd love to be able to ride a horse. Two. We won't be able to come. Park. We won't be able to park. Three. I've never been able to dance. Speak French. I've never been able to speak French. Four. She hates not being able to drive. Cook. She hates not being able to cook. Five. Will you be able to find it? Afford it. Will you be able to afford it? Six. He'd love to be able to snowboard, windsurf. He'd love to be able to windsurf. Seven. I love being able to understand everyone, speak to everyone. I love being able to speak to everyone. Eight. They haven't been able to finish. Come. They haven't been able to come. Two point thirty eight. One. What do you think is the most exciting sport to watch? Two. What's the most amazing scenery you've ever seen? Three. What music do you listen to if you feel depressed? Four. Have you ever been disappointed by a birthday present? Five. Which do you find more tiring, speaking English or listening to English? Six. What's the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you? Seven. Are you scared of spiders? Eight. Do you feel very tired in the morning? Nine. Who's the most boring person you know? Ten. Do you ever get frustrated by technology? Two point thirty nine. One. Afrikaans. Hello. Two. German. Guten Tag. 
Three. French. Bonjour. Four. Hebrew. Shalom. Five. Russian. Привет. Six. English. Hello. Seven. Greek. Yasu. Eight. Catalan. Bon dia. Nine. Spanish. Hola. Ten. Dutch. Guten Dach. Eleven. Italian. Ciao. 2.40 1. One very easy thing you can do is just change the language to English on all the gadgets you have. For example, on your phone or laptop or tablet. That way you're reading English every day and without really noticing, you just learn a whole lot of vocabulary. For example, the things you see on your screen, like, are you sure you want to shut down now? Things like that. 2. My tip is to do things that you like doing, but in English. So, for example, if you like reading, then read in English. If you like movies, watch them in English with subtitles. If you like computer games, play them in English, but don't do things you don't enjoy in your language. I mean, if you don't like reading in your language, you'll enjoy it even less in English, and so you probably won't learn anything. 3. What really helped me to improve my English was having an American boyfriend. He didn't speak any Japanese. Well, not many foreigners do. So we spoke English all the time, and my English improved really quickly. We broke up when he went back to the U.S., but by then I could speak pretty fluently. We didn't exactly end up as friends, but I'll always be grateful to him for the English I learned. So my tip is, try to find an English-speaking boyfriend or girlfriend. 4. I've always thought that learning vocabulary is very important, so I bought a vocabulary flashcard app for my phone. I write down all the new words and phrases I want to remember in French and in English, and then, when I get a quiet moment, I test myself. It really helps me remember new vocabulary. So, that's my tip. Get a vocabulary learning app for your phone. 5. I think one of the biggest problems when you're learning something new is motivation. Something to make you continue and not give up. So, my tip is to book yourself a vacation in an English-speaking country or a country where people speak very good English, like the Caribbean, as a little reward for yourself and so you can actually practice your English. It's really motivating when you go somewhere and find that people understand you and you can communicate. Last year, I went to the Bahamas for a weekend, and I had a great time, and I spoke a lot of English. 6. If you love music, which I do, my tip is to listen to as many songs as possible in English, and then learn to sing them. It's so easy nowadays with YouTube. First, I download the lyrics and try to understand them. Then I sing along with the singer and try to copy the way he or she sings. This is fantastic for your pronunciation. Then, once I can do it well, I go back to YouTube and get a karaoke version of the song. And then I sing it. It's fun, and your English will really improve as a result. 2.41 1. Two. Goodbye. Three.
Four. Please leave a message after the tone. Hi, Jack. It's Sandra. I was just calling to confirm that meeting. Five. Six. Hello? Oh, hi. It's James. I called half an hour ago, but Anne wasn't there. Is she there now? Seven. Two point forty six. Should. Talk. Wrong. Listen. Half. Dishonest. Knowledge. Design. Whole. Rhythm. Doubt. Foreign. Calm. Island. Two point forty seven. One. You must turn off your phone on a plane. Two. You should only call him in an emergency. Three. We have to leave at eleven. Four. You must not open other people's emails. Five. You shouldn't talk loudly on a cell phone. Two point forty eight. I always thought that good manners were good manners wherever you were in the world, but that was until I met my boyfriend Jason, who is from Burma, also known as Myanmar. We met in upstate New York. When we were both students in college, when we first got to know each other, we were always surrounded by a group of friends. I liked Jason because he was funny and kind, and I could tell he liked me. But we never spent any time alone. The first time I suggested that we hang out without our friends, he said no without an explanation, which I thought was kind of rude. My feelings were hurt. So I didn't talk to him as much. The next time I saw Jason in our big group, he was just as friendly and happy as usual. I was confused. Finally, I asked him why he wouldn't hang out with me. He apologized, and then he told me that in Burma, it's custom to date in a group situation. Since he had only been in the U.S. for a few years, he was still having trouble navigating the two cultures he lived in. The more reserved Burmese culture and the more open American culture. A few months later, after we started dating, I asked him why he never responded to my cute romantic Facebook posts with more than "cool" or "thanks." It seemed weird to me that his responses weren't romantic, and honestly, I was a little jealous of the sweet posts my American friends' boyfriends left on their Facebook pages. But Jason told me in Burma. It's considered bragging to express your feelings in public, especially on a social networking site. He didn't want his family and friends to think he was bragging about his American girlfriend. From an American point of view, I thought he was being a bit cold. However, from a Burmese point of view, he was actually being respectful. As confused as I was about what's considered good and bad manners in Jason's culture, he felt the same way about American culture. He thought it was bad manners to refer to have a best friend, and he would argue with me whenever I called my friend Rachel my best friend. Jason said there is no such thing as a best friend in Burmese culture; there are only close friends. It would be inconsiderate to name one person as a best friend because your other friends would feel offended. Anyway, we've been together for two years, and we still have disagreements, but. We've learned that as long as we're a couple, we'll never completely agree about whether our manners are good or bad, and that most importantly, it's okay to agree to disagree. 
2.50. Christopher. How do you get to work? Um, I take the subway every day. I take two trains. I live in Brooklyn. I take a train from Brooklyn to uh, Washington Square. And then I switch to a train that takes me to Midtown Manhattan. How long does it take? It takes about、uh, 30 to 40 minutes. What do you think is the best way to get around New York City? I think subways are an excellent way to get around New York.、Uh, they serve all five boroughs and they're open 24 hours a day. So they're very convenient and they don't get stuck in traffic. Maria. Do you think women are better than men with young children, or do you think that's just a stereotype? Hmm, I think women are, they have a, they're, they're more natural with young children. They, they have a natural ability with them. They're, they're, they're better at sort of knowing what they need and、um, perhaps, um, uh, yeah, knowing if they, if they need hugs or food or things like that. And、um, perhaps their manner is, is better with young children.、Uh, I think men can do it,、um, but perhaps it, they. Takes a bit more practice. Harry. Some new research says that men talk just as much as women. Do you think that's true? Definitely think that's true. I would say that I know men who talk more than women talk,、uh, especially in my family. It's the men who do most of the talking, especially repeating the same story time and time again. Do you think men and women talk about different things? Yes, I think they do talk about different things. I think they have different interests, and so they will try and control the conversation to topics that interest them rather than everyone else. Skylar. Is there anything you've tried to learn but failed? I've always wanted to learn to paint very well, but I have never been very good at it, so it's not my thing. <laughs> Have you stopped trying? I still paint for fun, but I still i m not very good, so I just do it for leisure activity. Christina. Is there anything that people do with their phones that really annoys you?、Um, yeah, lots of things, but what really, really gets to me is when, when people are interacting with you, but they're looking at the phone at the same time, or you know, when you're having dinner. If They keep checking their phone, that bothers me.